We are here to talk about artificial intelligence today. Um, learning outcomes for you at the end of this. Uh, we will all be smarter about AI, which is not a very well-written learning outcome, is it? Um, having uh, Jen and, and, and Byron in the room, <laughs> like, I don't think that would pass muster, would it? Um, we will understand what generative AI is and how it impacts our lives and what some of the threats and fears are and the problems with it. We will come to understand how it affects teaching and learning and many of the ways in which people are adapting to it across campus and many of the suggested ways in which more people uh, could adapt regardless of where you land on the continuum from embrace to resist. Because um, this is a judgment-free zone. We're here to learn and to help each other adapt whatever that adaption requires. And finally, something we haven't talked as much about uh, on campus because Senate has um, obviously and justifiably grabbed onto the issue of what this is and how it affects teaching and learning, but it also impacts us in terms of workforce development. So uh, we're also going to learn a little bit about what the likely impacts are on jobs and how that works backward into our programming and what we have to think about for future programming. Uh, so let me introduce our panel to you. Um, we're doing this with internal experts because I don't think we have to go very far to find people who know a lot about how this impacts our lives and teaching and learning and what we can do to adapt it to it and how it impacts workforce development. So first off, uh, to address what generative AI is, and we're going to limit our discussion of generative AI, talk a little bit about that. What is ChatGPT as a small segment of that? what the fears are, what the concerns are, what the deficits are of artificial intelligence as it is stands today, uh, and what that future might look like. Uh, we have Homi and, and Nadia who are going to tell us, please, a little bit about your role at the college, so people who don't know you in the room or in the recording know a little bit more about you. Homi, let's start with you. Hi, everyone. My name is Homi Bodanwala. I am a instructor at Saddleback teaching computer science, started here um, as an adjunct in 2016, and I am in my third year um, as a full-time instructor. Um, had a lot of experience in tech outside of that, a lot of consulting. Uh, my first job actually out of college involved um, some aspects of AI, and for me personally, it's actually quite amazing to see how much has advanced from like when I was learning AI in school to what you can do today. So I'm excited to be here today and share my experiences. Thank you, homie. Nadia Aman. Hi, I'm Nadia. I have a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science. Um, I did my thesis on reinforcement learning, um, which is another form of machine learning, subset of machine learning for control systems. Um, I've been in the field um, since 2010, so I've seen machine learning and artificial intelligence really evolve over time, and I've been teaching at Saddleback in the computer science department for over 10 years. John. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Hadamio, and I'm Dean of Economic and Workforce Advancement here at Saddleback College, and I've been in Economic and Workforce Advancement now for about 18 years in the community colleges. Kind of an inherited role is I moved to... Uh, from doing a lot of partnership work in the local economy in a little town called Delano uh, for Bakersfield College. Economic workforce advancement really works uh, both on and on campus with workforce providers, employers, um, regional collaborators, as well as here on campus with our different academic programs, primarily, of course, CTE programs. So hopefully I can shed some light on how this is going to impact occupations going forward. Suki. Hi, I'm Suki. Am I close enough? Okay. Hi, I'm Suki Fisher. I am part of the English department. And um, so obviously, chat GBT has definitely had an impact on us. And so um, unlike some of the people at this table, I do not have a lot of background on chat GPT, but my approach has been to look at it through the lens of what are the reasons why a student might go to another source to help them with writing a paper and what are the things that I can do to prevent that. So that's why I think I'm here. Brett. There you go. Yeah, I right. told you it's tricky. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brett Myron, and I am a professor in the English department. I had to think about that for a second, apparently. Um, and I'm also one of the coordinators for online education, along with uh, Jim Pakula here. And she and I have been 
uh, reading and thinking for a long time about generative AI because of our involvement with online ed. And so uh, I think that's why I'm here today, to talk about ways that we might uh, look at these technologies and think about how they influence the way we teach and the way that our students might learn in our classes. I'm Jen. I'm Jen Bakula, and I've been at Saddleback for 16 years. I'm a chair of the economics department, there we go, um, and co-chair of the OE committee with Brett. And I like looking at AI in general as from the economic side of efficiency and how it's going to increase productivity for us as instructors, looking at it from the student perspective as well, and accessibility. And that's a big thing for me, if you know all any email I've sent is all about accessibility. Yep. Thank you so much. Welcome you all. I welcome you all and thank you for participating in this. They've um, given a lot of thought to this. Obviously, they've been involved in a lot of this, both from the technical side and the teaching and learning side, and John from the workforce side. Um, but it takes extra effort to prepare something like this for you all, and we've had a separate meeting um, to prepare for it. So I just want to thank you all for your time and agreeing to do this, because I know we're all busy people. Um, yeah, you can applaud. Thank you. I, they, they get that. More at the end. Um, I have some prepared questions for our panelists. Hopefully, they'll get it whatever you want to ask, but we'll try to leave room open at the end for your questions as well. Um, but hopefully, I'm anticipating and getting all the, the feeds in the room, um, and we'll know what you want to know, and we'll get there eventually, so be patient. Again, we are recording it. If you miss anything, feel free to watch the recording afterwards. We've also invited our panelists to uh, submit materials in an electronic folder, in a SharePoint folder, that we'll make available to you uh, with a QR code at the end of the panel. So you don't need to take notes. Anything that you want that they talk about that they reference as materials, particularly Jen and Brett, because this is what they do in terms of supporting faculty, um, we'll have available to you. And you can always use them as resources for anything uh, that we don't talk about, but that you want help with in terms of uh, educational technology as well. Um, so let's get started in terms of some basic primers. So what is generative AI? And, and how is ChatGPT related to generative AI? Because I think too many people, when they start out, they've had exposure to chat GPT, and we say, that's AI. And they say, ah, well, that's AI. That's all I know about AI. So what's AI in general, and how does chat GPT fit in the various categories of AI? And are there other things in AI that we should know about that impact teaching and learning besides chat GPT? So we'll go in order. First, Homie, and then Nadia. Sure. OK. So first, let me try to describe it this way. Um, AI is anything that is trying to simulate, let's say, a faculty of human intelligence, which is why we're calling it artificial intelligence, right, to distinguish it from human intelligence. And really, it comes down to data, OK? So we have all this data. And closely related to AI, like maybe like a subset of AI would be what we hear like machine learning. And when you think of machine learning, Think of it as you've got all this data collected, and in, you're trying to tell a computer what to do. So instead of saying, hey, in the case of x, y, and z, do something, well, now you've got so much data that you can start analyzing the data and have the computer sort of learn the best approach. So when we think of machine learning, we can think of like classification systems. Like I throw a bunch of data at a computer, and I say, with these inputs, this is a pizza. With these inputs, this is a hot dog. With these inputs, this is a popsicle. As I gather all this data and different features that I'm waiting, I can start training the computer to say, this is your training set. This is the data that describes what a definition of a pizza is or a hot dog is in terms of these features that make up that definition. And then when I throw new data at it, it can say, oh, OK, you gave me this data. so." You know what, that's probably a pizza. It's more of a pizza than it is a hot dog. At the end of the day, what I'm getting at is this still just comes down to math. And it's a lot of like how recommendation systems might work on Amazon, right? So you're taking a bunch of data. You still need a human element, though, of determining what those feature sets are, like what features might be important to look at, OK? What I think has made this really exciting is now with the volume of data that has come, when we look at generative AI, we are now saying, hey, we've got all this data. 
we can do this classification. But now let's use this to generate new data, right? And so that's, that's the best way to look at it. So you ask Chad GPT a question. I guess from my perspective, it's not really truly thinking. It's just that we've given it data. The models have gotten so good. And so those models are now being used to generate more data. So that would probably be the simplest way I, I would describe it. So, how many, so the data that's available in ChatGPT that you speak of is all the data on the internet. Um, it's whatever it's searching, right? So, like, so ChatGPT like has different models, and I think like their it's three point five model, whatever it was before. I think its data goes back to like whatever it's cataloged since like twenty twenty one, and so as those models evolve, it just how much data is being trained into that model. So, Nadi, wh where else are we seeing AI in our lives besides ChatGPT? So AI is actually a major part of our lives now. I mean, if any of you guys have driven a Tesla and you have automated like assist driving, um, that is essentially using um, AI and it's using it to predict uh, like what it thinks the best outcome it is and then it will suggest an action to you and then it will follow through, you either follow through with that action or not, right? So there's kind of this human still in the loop when we th talk about these systems. And these systems are, you know, just like Homie was saying, um, they are function approximations over large sets of data. And so there's different kinds of data out there, right? There's text data, which is what ChatGPT and these large language models primarily deal with. And there's also um, vision data, which is the kind of data that's streaming in from the sensors in your car, right? Especially if you're driving a Tesla, you see a lot of, there's a lot of imagery that's being captured of the road and of the cars ahead of you. Um, in addition to that, there's sound signals. So that's a kind of a data as well. And in all of these models, what they do is they approximate, just like we would with students in the classroom, right? We always come up with a bell curve, we look at the grades, right? And then we, we approximate where the mean is, right? And we approximate which, where the tail ends are and who gets an A and who gets, you know, so on and so forth. And so it's the same thing with, with data sets is that we're trying to find the statistical mean. Um, generative AI is a different kind of AI. Um, where your it's been trained on large textual data sets, which we have the advantage of because of the age of the internet, right? Internet produced a lot of textual data, and it learns uh, characteristics of grammar um, and the English language um, with that data. And then it can generate, um, either it could do a sentiment analysis on that data, or it can interpret and generate new information from that data. There's classic problems that are in that space. Um, but AI is, is actually even simpler than that. Um, if you look at AI from the perspective of um, programming, the simplest AI that students learn is an if-else statement, like if this, do that, and else, do something else. And that's actually known in AI as a reflex agent because it um, behaves like reflex, like as a reflex, you impose rules on it and that's how it functions. So AI has been a, in a part of our lives for a very, very long time. If you do math, you do AI in a way, right? So it's, it's just how fast the technology is moving nowadays. Um, and it seems even faster because of COVID. So um, the paper on GPT, actually GPT-3 came out in 2020. What were we in the middle of? We were in the middle of COVID. And so we didn't really pay attention to that technology until recently when things started um, blowing up in terms of you know, these um, generative image models, right? Where you can like now generate art, um, you can, generate text. And all of this seemed to be a boom, but it's been cooking for a really long time. Like since the 70s, people have been working on, on this problem. Um, and really the goal is to free up our time um, so that we don't have to do menial tasks, right? And so that's kind of like the good intentions of AI. Um, in the beginning. So I don't know if I answered your question. Um, you did. Um, so why is everybody starting to freak out? Like it seemed like we, we didn't even notice it was happening in our cars and our appliances. Um, and then ChatGPT came out and then the letter came out with all the tech leaders signing, like, whoa, we need to regulate this. What, what is this thing that everyone is afraid of getting out of the bottle without regulation? Tell us, what is the fear? Because it, 
it scares me that the fear is among the people who know the most about it. So oh. help me understand that. Should I? Can Both I? of you, okay. please, Nadia. Okay, so the fear is that when you have, so the technology is really fast, and it's um, getting to a point where it's faster than a human can intervene. So if you potentially have a generative model talking to another generative model, they can speak at a faster, like the speed of the internet, whereas a human takes time to process, right? So the spread of, um, so really the, the big questions that are out there right now is the spread of misinformation, um, understanding what is generated and not. So if you look at these databases that are like, this is not a person, right? But the images look just like a person, right? So how can you, with your human eyes, right, be able to discern what is generated and what is not, right? It, it takes, I mean, the technology has advanced, but humans also need to adapt to that advancement, right? We need to um, be a little bit more careful in what we believe, right? Just believing what chat GPT tells you can often cause trouble, especially when students are citing sources and those sources lead to, I don't know, a uh, Samsung refrigerator instead of <laughs> like, Mark Twain's poetry or something like that, right? So, um, so that's that's one of the main reasons why it can be problematic. And and another reason is you know who holds the data and who holds the model, right? Uh, how does what does this mean in terms of diversity? Because there's some data that's being um, interpreted and ingested, but that data is reflective of a certain bracket of people and population, um, and not necessarily. Um, you know, those that are in the minority. One of the things I, I want to ask you about, Nadia, while you're speaking, um, because it came out in our pre-discussion, was this concept of model drift and data drift. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that was of some concern to me when you first explained it to me. Oh, yeah. So um, model drift happens when a model almost is out of trend. So, you know, like if a model has been trained on a specific data set that's like really hot and like juicy at a specific time frame, that can quite quickly go out of trend. So you see this with ChatGPT. Less and less students are, start, are using ChatGPT. They're turning to other engines that may be um, trained kind of on a continuous basis or a more frequent basis. And the same thing with data drift. How many of you can't understand what your students are saying? Right? Because they have like their own colloquialisms that maybe we don't really resonate with because we don't, we're not used to it. So um, that's an example of how language can change quite dramatically over time. And our data sets, if they've been trained back in 2020 and their phrases like no cap or like it's giving, you know, like how do you interpret that? Like what, is, what does that mean? Um, and is ChatGPT gonna use that in their answer? <laughs> Probably not. And so um, because data changes quite rapidly, I mean, think about the amount of data that is being um, kind of emitted by social media on a daily basis, huge amounts of data. And social media is constantly changing. Like what's trending is constantly changing. And so um, your models can quite quickly become irrelevant. I, I want to emphasize that first point about model drift, because if you're, all, if you're at one end of the continuum of like, I am not accepting this, I am going to stop it no matter what, and you're talking about chat GPT, your students have already moved on beyond chat GPT. Yeah. You're, you're working on Ask Jeeves at this point mm -hmm. um, and not realizing that they already know they're going to get caught on that and they've moved on to the next thing. So I, I just want to lay out you know, the reality out there as we talk about ways to address this. Um, so for, for either of you, talk a little bit about teaching you know, modern technology to students. Like I've heard, for instance, coding jobs are going away. Like, what's happening with coding, homie? Is it safe? So I'm going to explain this another way. So when I was in school, there was still a big emphasis on make sure you know all the functions inside that header file because, you know, it wasn't as easy to go and look up that information. Okay, then Google came around. And the emphasis was less on the memorizing because the information was so accessible, right? And so that trend is increasing. I'm not saying it's okay to have like no memory. I'm not saying that either. Um, but what I'm saying is it's just pushing the trend more toward being able to apply what you're learning. 
And I think what is happening with what we're seeing in chat GPT, at least in tech, is no different, right? So companies out there will pay to get their employees a chat GPT license. Why? Because if they have a question, they'll chat GPT it and they'll get an answer. Now, they're also knowing that the engineers that they're hired are able to discern and pull what's useful from that response versus what's not so useful, right? So I think with any technological shift, the part that gets a little bit scary is yes, it probably could displace some level of programming, but this also comes from the misconception that an engineer or a programmer's main job is to sit there and type something explicitly as to what to do. There's still so much more that goes behind designing the problem. Like, what's the problem? What's the solution? Why am I designing it this way? What are the trade-offs I'm making? You're not gonna get that from ChatGPT or any other model, right? So what we're seeing is that when I, when I hear those things come through, I hear it more of like, you've probably just missed the boat of like who you're displacing. Is it going to be able to displace maybe like work that I was outsourcing that maybe didn't require much human thought? Sure. So that's just like a cost saving measurement for the company. But in terms of like the engineers or the talent that's in there that's still doing the real thinking, I don't think it's gonna replace that. I think what it's doing though is it's setting the bar higher. So in, a, in an interesting way, it's actually forcing everyone in the industry to up level. If you do not up level, yes, you will become obsolete. But that's just how technology is anyway. So and, I think it's just reinforcing that trend. And, and let's bring John into it at this point. I, I certainly want to save a lot of that for the end, John, but I do want to ask you at this point. Like I've often heard the displacement in the workforce is going to be the lower level jobs that can be done with artificial intelligence <laughs> and the future belongs to the content makers. The future belongs to the creatives. Is that a general trend? Because in, in some ways, Homie is, is saying, if I'm hearing you right, Homie, don't worry about programming, don't worry about coding. It, there's, still, there's still jobs for that. It's just going to be a higher level job and it's not going to be as much grunt work of typing and typing and typing. Is, is there a general trend of that, John, that people are talking about in, in economic development as well? Yes, I can relate to that. <clears throat> First of all, I'll say my first job um, was replaced by technology. <clears throat> I used to have to change the channel for my parents on the TV set, but they got a remote control. <laughs> so all well and good. It was an advantage in the end. But the reality is most of what this is going to replace are tasks. And there's very much a difference between a task and a job and certainly a job and a career. So what it's going to do is it's going to change the aspects of jobs dramatically maybe in some areas, less so in others. Jobs that are heavily routine, um, repetitive in nature, um, are probably ones that are at much greater risk, which is roughly a little over a third of the jobs in the economy. But that said, it will change the jobs. It won't necessarily eliminate the jobs. And hopefully what it'll do by bringing greater efficiency is actually do what the IT generation did where it actually created more jobs than it displaced. So all you have to do is look at all the dot com and the Googles and the Salesforce and all the different buildings that are around and you realize that the economy survived the IT conversion. AI is a different version of that and there'll be things that we'll have to do but the beauty of it is here in the community colleges, we are probably one of the most prepared entities to help you pre prepare for those changes. I don't want to share too much yet, but upskilling is going to be the new norm, much so than in the past. So let's get to more about teaching and learning, and I definitely want to come back to Homi and Nadi about that too in terms of, in terms of uh, teaching computer science and teaching in SIM. Um, but let's, let's figure out the, the continuum of the ways to approach this. And I, I'm gonna bring Brett into the conversation at this point, Brett, because you've kind of developed a, a framework of addressing this in almost sort of a chronologic fashion. Um, and, and that might create a nice framework for us for having this discussion. So tell us about that, please. And again, this will be available digitally in the SharePoint folder that we'll share out. Yes, yeah, we um, created a document, when I say we, the folks on the online team, uh, we created a couple of documents that were designed to get people to think about how they might approach um, teaching. I think there was a lot of, I'll call it panic maybe, uh, you know, back in November, and I'm not, this is, you know, uh, 
nationwide. Um, we had a moment of existential crisis thinking about instruction and how we were going to do assessment. Um, and I think that's understandable, right? I mean, people were saying, we were watching videos online, we were testing this tool out ourselves and thinking, gee, I've just put my prompt into this um, software and it spit out an essay that I probably would have given a B. Um, and so, you know, what am I to do in that scenario? And so that's where uh, Jen and I and others were thinking about how to address um, that situation. And there are a variety of ways to approach it. So I, I, I want to start by saying that um, I'm not here to tell anybody what to do. Um, but I think there are a variety of different approaches, one of which is authentic assessment. And Jen, I think, can, can speak more to that. Um, what we also did is we looked at, and this is the document that, that Elliot's referring to. I'm, I'm getting to that point. <laughs> I've told Jen to kick me under the table if I talk too long. Did she kick you yet? Yeah, no, not yet. <laughs> You're good. But I could see her warming up. That's why I wanted to go back there. <laughs> and uh, we created a document that basically, like you said, looks at it in terms of time. So it says, you know, here's what you can do before the assessment. And this would be things like putting policies on your syllabus, having discussions with your students, um, talking about these kinds of tools before you even get to any kind of quote unquote examination, right? Then you can do things during the assessment, right? Putting language in the assessment itself that says, here's what I think you can or, or I'm going to allow you to do or not allow you to do. Um, and then there's also what you might do after the assessment, right? And, and in this case, we're thinking about how you might try to um, talk to a student if you feel like there's been a problem. Here's what I will say about those three different moments, the before, the during, and the after. I feel like most of the conversations that I've seen have been focused on that last piece, right? What do we do at the end, which is how do we catch students and how do we then punish them for doing these things? And I feel like we're putting way too much energy in that, in that moment in time. We should be putting more of our energy into the first two places and especially at the very beginning so that we can have conversations before we get to that last place. Um, and there's more to say on that, but I think that's the general gist of it, thinking about it in terms of time. And uh, that last point, Brett, reminds me of like plagiarism discussions that we had 10, 15 years ago, yes. where we were very focused on what do you do when a student plagiarizes, and then we started having all these discussions about plagiar plagiarism prevention, um, and the idea that how you, how you create the assignment may make a difference in whether someone is going to plagiarize. But before we get to that, and I want to talk to you and Jen more about that, I want to bring Suki into this, because Suki, you have an interesting approach that isn't focused as much on the assignment or catching the student, but on the student. So tell us about that. I, th I think you have a specific um, story in mind, but can I, like, you can go okay. wherever you want with it. Uh, I'm going to go over there. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Jen's going to kick me. Um, so I, I will say I agree with Brett that there was a lot of fear. And I think one of the things that especially um, I do start every class talking about chat GPT with my students and um, partially just so that they understand that I'm not interested in them using it in my class. And it's because I don't have the tools yet to know how to use it effectively. And I'm being told that I can. I just don't know how yet. Um, and so so I, one of the things that I want to start with is why are you here? Why am I asking you to write essays? It isn't because I just love grading. It's because I'm actually helping you become a thinker. And that's the thing that I worry about is that by them going and taking a shortcut, they're shortchanging themselves and that they're not learning how to process their um, thoughts in a way that's coherent. And so... Um, now, I did do the authentic assessment training with Jen, and I think that it helped a lot. And again, I don't think that there's a way to foolproof anything, um, but it really got me to thinking about scaffolding and what I need to do before to set up the assignment so that it's accessible, because sometimes when they get the assignment, they're so overwhelmed by it. That might be one of the reasons why they cheat. And they, you know, we had this conversation. It's not like this was suddenly the way that everybody cheated. Like people have cheated since they, you know, since we've had school. Um, and so I really focus on taking away the things that might make them feel like the assignment is too overwhelming. I, you know, give them pre-writing. I give them feedback on it. We talk about it in class. Do I say I'm perfect? No, absolutely not. Um, but when, the, uh, did you want me to talk about that one? You could, I, was, oh. I was just going for this, this idea of addressing oh. the student 
Yeah. Like, why are you here? What are you foregoing well, by, by using this tool that and, isn't part of this class? And the other side of it is that I think that, especially because we're getting the, the freshmen who were in high school, so what did the high school teachers do? They either ignored it or they're like, oh my gosh, you can just have this right for you. And I'm like, why are you doing that? But um, the other thing is that they've been taught you are all cheaters and I do not trust any of you. And so when my students were taking their first, they, they had it on the syllabus. It said, you have a reading quiz. And I came to class and like half of them, even though they didn't read the directions, but they didn't take the quiz because they said, oh, aren't we doing this in class? And I said, no, you're doing it online. And they're like, oh, no, we were always had to take the quiz in class. And so that was one way to address it. But... Most of the students, I would like to believe that they don't, they're not, they, they're there for a reason and they do want to learn. And if you treat them like, I'm going to catch everyone, you're not going to catch everyone. But it also, um, how it makes them feel um, is something to take into consideration. Um, I will stop talking unless you want me to say more. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back okay. to you. So um, Je- let's, let's bring in a couple of these, these terms and, and what Jen and Brett do every day in terms of supporting people in this work. So um, Jen, let, let's dive right into authentic assessment. What is authentic assessment? So I think when we think about assessments in general, this is AI gives us the opportunity to really change how we think about assessment. Is it process? Is it product? What are we ultimately trying to get to with our students? And to Suki's point about process, about having scaffolding. And then when you create something that's more authentic that a student can take with them, um, the other term is non-disposable. There's so many assignments that we do. They do it in class and they crumble it up on their way out the door because they don't care anymore. It has no life after the course. But when you create a larger project, project project-based learning, authentic assessments, they have some life beyond the class, or they can be applied in other parts of their life or their career. And that, even creating big projects has many, you know, certain levels and check-ins that could prevent AI because they're, you know, you're starting with an outline and then a draft, and then you're getting a check-in, then you're doing another draft, and it's building over time so if a student has zero, zero, zero on all these assignments and then poof, it has a 15 page paper, maybe you have a better sense that there was some AI support or support in general. But if they're going through all these check-ins, then you know that they're working on it. And I, same with Suki, I tell my students day one, but I'm coming at it from the economist point of view of AI is amazing, this is efficiency, this is productivity, but I know it's out there and I tell them, I don't want you using it on this assignment for these reasons. I want you thinking about this and I want you to apply. And if you fail, that's fine. I don't care if you get it wrong. I want you to be thinking about it and applying it. And then if you fail, let's work on it and revise and then add on to the next step. So I think that it doesn't matter what you teach. This is a time to rethink how you assess your students. Whatever assignments you have, if you have an assignment where last semester half of them came up as you know you thought they were plagiarized or written by AI, maybe that's a bad assignment for you and your students, right? Maybe it's time to kind of rethink what you're doing and try something different and try to engage your students. So uh, an authentic assignment, authentic, authentic assignment, assessment with an assignment, um, you stop me when I'm wrong, feels more micro. It feels contextualized and applied to the student. So one, it's more real, and it, it's a form of almost applied learning, a higher level, and it's not on the internet. It's, it's asking them to come back with something that's not on the internet. Is that a fair summary? Yes, and hopefully not on the internet. That, yes. I mean, yeah, but yes, yeah, that's a fair assessment. Um, and, and let's go backwards and talk about syllabi. So um, I know that people are struggling, and you probably, I'm gonna guess you have some template language to suggest, but, but what are the keys, what are the principles for all faculty in the room and who later watch this to be using to state a policy um, on AI in their classroom? And by the way, is that limited to chat GPT or do they need to address larger issues of AI? A lot, a lot there. Okay, let me see if I hit everything. Sorry. Um, first is, I think Brett and I agree on this. I don't care what your policy is. You can love it, you can hate it, you can be in the middle. That's great just tell your students, right? So we don't care what your policy is. We have documents to share later on that have some blurbs if 
AI is never ever allowed, or it is sometimes, or freely use it. Okay, I don't care. You do you. Just tell your students what your policy is. And I think as long as you're coming out at the very beginning and saying it. Chat GPT is a drop in the bucket on what our students know about with AI. There's so many different AI tools out there that students can use. And so even being aware of different options or different software that they can use, I think is really helpful. Uh, you had another question in there. So actually, let me, let me start with your first answer and, and bring Homi and Nadia back on that one. So are there tools in what you're teaching that students are already using to, that you have to be aware of? So, I mean, you're not teaching writing and research per se. Um, but are there tools that students are using in other areas besides research and writing? Um, I'm sure they are, but I want to answer that question by pulling in some strands of what I heard before. Okay. What I have learned just in teaching in general, that there, there's two things that dissuade academic dishonesty. The first is making it relevant to the student. And what has worked wonders for me in doing that is actually by doing this, like bigger projects. And now I've actually started playing with this idea of I have a project and I want the project to demonstrate certain technical concepts that I'm teaching you. But I would like you to go and tell me, like, so if, like for one class I have, it was like, I want to show these things. I'm sure you guys have been in CS for a while. There must be some great program you've been wanting to write. I would like you to write a proposal of what that project is, and that is the project you guys are going to go build. So immediately by doing that, I've already created buy-in from the student. I feel like the probability of them actually going and shortcutting it has significantly reduced. So now I've taken the focus off of being a policeman toward like, now let's do this. Let's build what you want. Let's have our sessions. Let's still have milestones and deliverables that you're going to deliver on, but scaffold it in a way that's relevant to you, right? So that has worked well. At certain levels, um, I actually would be okay with saying, if you forgot how to do this, I'm okay. Go ahead and chat GPT it. But whatever you submit should still be your own. And just let me know, hey, couldn't do this, chat GPT it. So at least when I'm looking at it, I can see, like, did you at least learn the concept that you needed to learn when you pull that information out, right? Don't just pull it out and paste it in and say, it works. Pull it out and paste in it and say, I've deconstructed it. And now by looking at this, I've actually increased my own understanding, right? So this kind of goes hand in hand with, like, programming. Sometimes the best way to learn is not even to see what I'm writing on the board. I know what I wrote on the board is correct. But if I can have you take the student's paper next to you look at theirs and tell them where they were wrong, you're gonna have this right. So it's kind of that same approach. So go get the data generated, but look at it and refer to it that way, and then kind of build back up to see like where that happened. So there's tools that they can use. I tend to not adopt the, and a lot of this just comes from my perspective. I'm from the camp of like, embrace it, and I have to adapt. So if these are the problems I'm facing, I need to embrace it. Because it doesn't matter if there's a group of people trying to regulate it. Look, until it's regulated, I still don't have any control. So I still have to adapt, and I still have to find ways to navigate around it. So that's kind of like the creative creativity piece that I bring in. I'm trying to make it more relevant. I'm trying to make the projects larger. I do this as early as CS1A, which is like the first programming assignment. Um, and that even came out of something non-AI related. So I was at a, at a meeting with Lyft before the IPO, the ride sharing program. And they brought students back and said, you graduated, you had a great GPA, we, we took you into the Lyft. What was the hardest thing you had to learn? You know what it was? Oh my God, when I was in school, everything was disposable. I could do homework assignment and I could throw it away and never have to see it again. Anyone can do that. In software development and engineering, the hardest thing is you have to be creative. You have to organize your code. You have to think about other people working with you. You have to be able to put your work product in a form that can be iterated upon and expanded upon. And so if you start bringing that in early, 
I also think it brings kind of the excitement of the field into it. And it takes the rote part of it of like, hey, I'm just turning an assignment. Let me get the grade and let me be done. So if you scaffold all those things, I feel like you can make chat GPT a tool, just like I can say, go make Google a tool. And it will just be one thing. But it is not going to be able to do that entire project and get you like the A at the end of the semester. And I'm sitting here wondering like, oh, was this whole thing just fabricated? Yeah. So that's kind of my approach. What, what I love about your assignment and the way you approach it is it really combines something Jen was saying about authentic assessment, assessment which is making it relevant to the student. What could be more relevant than designing their own assignment? Um, but also it brings in what Suki was saying, which is sort of at a meta level, helping them understand the relevance to their learning. They understand what they're missing in that assignment if they just go and, and develop it using artificial intelligence. So it's really a combination of those two forms of authenticity that I, I really like. Um, so, Nadia, you, you know more about the uses of machine learning that probably impact us than anybody in this room. So tell me a little bit more. What else is out there that, that is impacting teaching and learning? And I'd love to hear what you think is out there that's impacting your own teaching and learning and how. Yeah, so I've actually embraced it in my classroom. And there's other tools out there. So for coding, there is a tool called GitHub Copilot. And it behaves as like a co-pilot to help you out in case you're stuck on coding. So it will suggest code snippets to you. Um, but the nice thing about it is that it may suggest a code snippet to you, but it might not necessarily be right. Um, so I've embraced using that. Um, I have students um, use tools like Claude AI, which helps them um, understand and digest textbook knowledge so they can get a summary of the textbook. Um, they can put it, they can use optical um, OCR, like optical character recognition technology, to then convert PDFs and try to help them learn. Any, any kind of tool that they can use to assist their learning, I'm um, incredibly supportive of, of that. Um, and it's actually increased the performance of the students in my classes. So what that forces me as an instructor to do is to raise the bar for myself. Because now when I'm creating assignments, um, I have to approach it a little bit more creativity, like cre creatively, creatively, right? Um, and these students are achieving amazing things. And these are students in Saddleback themselves. So um, shameless plug, we have a showcase event coming this Friday. Um, of our Saddleback College students who have engaged in graduate level, postgraduate level research. And they have had not a bit of Python coding experience whatsoever. It's in fact with the help of these tools that a lot of them um, have taken the learnings from the C++ programming um, series here at Saddleback and applied it to other software um, like code programming languages. And because of these generative tools, they're now looking at the design of software at a completely different level. They're looking at it from the level of creating systems. How can we create a larger system and, and how can we have a user interact with that system? And so the students have gone ahead, they've done interviews with potential users for the code. Um, they're working with potential users of the code and they're from Southwest Research Institute. Um, and uh, they've been designing their own machine learning modeling system. So it's an image search lookup, just like you would do an image search on, in Google. Um, they've actually written the code to do that, but for a heliophysics application. So the, this is satellite imagery of the sun um, that they've tiled so people can now do a reverse image lookup of a solar flare and find um, the closest solar flares that have occurred in the last few years. Um, and then they can get timestamps for that and study that. So they've actually created a really useful tool. Um, so I'm really excited. It really has changed, changed the game for me. But again, it takes, um, you know, it's a little bit more demanding for our faculty members because that means that now we, the way we approach what is cheating what is an assignment? Um, how do I structure the assignment so that they still meet the student learning outcomes of this class? And how do I now transition this class from you know, 1998 to 2023? 
And I think that that's a big ask of teachers and teachers should have the support that they need, like faculty should have the support that they need to transition into this new phase because it's, it's key that we don't become obsolete. The worst thing that could happen is a student come back to us and say, well, I didn't really know how to use your class right in, in my job. Like you'd want somebody to say, your class helped me get a job, land a job, and I used it. Um, even if it means like I learned how to work in a team. Like that already is like, you have achieved something. You have really made an impact on that student's life. So for um, Suki and, and Brett and, and Jen, um, are there examples of using AI in teaching, writing, and research that faculty that you know of are using if they're embracing it? I've read about people um, engaged in iterative learning where um, ChatGPT is used for an initial draft or they have to write the initial draft before they use ChatGPT. Can you cite any examples where people are using it? I'll go first. The one thing I do want to mention about students using AI tools and Mike Sauter from DSPS told us, make sure you say this at some point today, that many DSPS students use Otter AI to record lectures and to get transcripts. And so it's another great AI tool. And this is not where we would say no AI in our classroom because this is helping students. So it's not just chat GPT, there's this huge spectrum. So voice recognition software is a form of AI. Exactly. Just putting it out there. Okay. Yes. Um, I think from the faculty side, one of the great uses of chat GPT for faculty is making videos accessible. So if you have video lectures in your online classes, by state law, they have to have accurate, by federal law, they have to have accurate closed captions, meaning capitalization and punctuation. And the auto captions from YouTube are horrible, but you can download your YouTube auto captions, throw them into chat GPT, give it the command of fix this for capitalization punctuation, get beautiful new captions, throw them back into YouTube, sync it up and it's perfect. So this is something that many faculty avoided doing because if you had a 20 minute video trying to fix every little item in your auto captions would have take hours. And so this now can have eliminate that me remedial task, right? That you can have it done in a snap of your fingers. So that's a great tool. A tool that I use, I love Gamma app. Gamma app creates slide decks. I have zero expertise in creating cool PowerPoints, but my students enjoy a colorful, visually appealing PowerPoint compared to my boring white black font, no pictures. So I can go on the Gamma app and I can say, create me a college level lecture about macro, or about monopoly market structure and antitrust regulation. It can create something for me and then that's my starting point. It's visual, it's very appealing, there's cool images. I fix it up to what I wanna talk about and then now I have this awesome deck. And so I have found that to be a great tool for myself. Great, and even I think on the latest version of PowerPoint, there's the design button, yeah. which is actually you know a form of AI that's suggesting a bunch of graphics. My funny story about that is Tram did a PowerPoint for a presentation, I forgot what flex that was, uh, and she hit the design button and she had her name, it was her introductory slide. So it, it filled in a picture of like a shuttle train, like a tram. Um, so it's, it's pretty literal, uh, you know, the deficits of artificial intelligence as we know it. I wanna ask a couple questions um, with a student lens on. Um, okay, you're gonna be super explicit with me in your syllabi about whether you accept uh, use of ChatGPT or other generative AI, um, but this is kind of confusing. Like, why can't you all pick a policy and stick with it? Like, if, if somebody sees it as valuable to my learning, why, do, why does the next class not see it as valuable. How am I supposed to navigate this new world if I can't, if you, if all instructors have a different view of whether I can use this or not? I'll throw that open. Um, I think all instructors always have different ideas about what's gonna go on in their classroom. And I even say this to my composition students. Um, am I talking, I don't know. I say this to my composition students, like um, I have a certain way that I like my thesis statements. Brett might not like them that way. I have a certain way about conclusion paragraphs. Brett might disagree. Um, ultimately, are we teaching thesis statements and conclusion paragraphs? Yes, but we're doing it differently. And so what I have said to my students is I am teaching you how to organize your ideas. I'm teaching you how to 
create your idea, not create, but like I'm teaching you how to express your ideas. But I think about when I was in college, every single professor I had had a different way that they wanted me to write a paper. And so for students to assume that a one policy fits all, first of all, that's going to limit someone. Like what if we had it where we were like, no chat GPT at our school, no AI at our school. Well, we've just hurt Nadia. And, um, but if we have it where it's like, everybody should use everything. It's like, well, I mean, that's why I think it has to be tailored for individual use. And it also, so the second thing is about how much the person who is teaching the class, how much familiarity they have with um, these particular tools. Because again, if sorry, I keep saying Nadia, but Nadia has a lot of experience with it. So she can do some really cool stuff. I do not. And so um, I have to approach it differently. Um, and the final thing is just that there are different skills that we're asking them to do. It's not the same thing in every single class. Um, and so hopefully, whatever the policies are, the policies are tied to what we want students to achieve and how to support them and how they're achieving it and not um and not pun like not get them so focused on um you know being afraid that they're going to be caught cheating that they end up just kind of freezing i think yeah um my other one i said is a student lens but it's really an elliot lens so here it is i'm just going to be transparent i worry about us not teaching this new form of information literacy i am worried that things are already getting so difficult for students to understand truth versus falsity new versus old messaging um, and now we're adding another layer and if we don't teach them how to use it i don't know where they're expected to get that Please. I, I'm really not good at powering this microphone on. Uh, this is a great time to mention a library workshop, which is currently in process. It's not yet available, but um, Alicia is here in the audience, and she wanted me to mention the uh, a library workshop for students that does a lot of the work that you're talking about. And I would definitely put this in that category. So we're talking about information literacy. We're talking about tools that students need to learn. I think that Nadia and Homi would agree with that. Um, and we probably, I would argue, are doing our students a disservice if we aren't trying to help them learn how to use these tools. So this workshop that is uh, not yet available, but will walk students through some of these processes about um, how to use different tools, what tools are available, what the risks are for using these tools. I think we haven't really talked a whole lot about that yet, but there certainly are some in terms of risks to the student's privacy. All of the data that you put into these things gets sucked up by those systems, right? And, and those companies own that data. Um, there's risks in terms of racial and gender and ethnic bias, right? So we've all seen that these machines are only as good as the information that has been fed into them, right? And so if all of that human bias that we know is out there on the internet, if they're being trained on that data, they are often going to spit it right back at us, right, in ways that I think we're going to find pretty frightening. So this workshop would be a great opportunity to explain to students those kinds of things um, and do some of that work that you're talking about, introducing ideas to students about uh, when would it be ethical or appropriate to use a specific tool or not. I'll use myself as an example. I often say to my students, it's not like um, AI is necessarily um, something that you want to avoid all the time. And I would never try to say anyone or tell anyone that because I myself use these tools and they, you might think of them on a range or a spectrum, you know, from um, autocomplete on your cell phone when you're typing text messages, right? Um, I think we've all been grateful for that many times. And not. Yeah, and not, right? <laughs> uh, to things like um, spell checker Grammarly, right? That, you know, as an English instructor, I know a lot of my students are concerned about this. And I tell them, it depends on the situation. So I use Grammarly myself when I'm typing emails. And I will tell you that I am very grateful to have that tool when I'm working on message number 74, you know, at four o'clock in the afternoon, typing it out. And the little lines on my screen are reminding me, you left out this really important word that would be a very embarrassing if you sent this email the way it is right now, right? You forgot to send your attachment. <laughs> All that stuff, right. And so there are moments in which it would be really appropriate, but maybe there are times when it isn't appropriate as well. And I think that's, you know, the, the opportunity for us to engage with students and intervene, have that conversation about when to um, do it. I want to wrap up our teaching and learning and, and then talk to John and then open it up. But um, uh, one or two last questions. I, I do want Sugi to tell her story too. Um, but, but I also want um, Brett to tell a story about testing uh, ChatGPT. So um, tell us a little bit about that, Brett. So for people who want to use enforcement, 
Um, if you're, if you're going to use enforcement, you know, the state-of-the-art tool, the brand, is Turnitin. Everybody knows about Turnitin, right? There are others as well. But Turnitin really prides itself in keeping up and being able to detect it. So Turnitin, you stop me when I'm wrong, gives you a range of percentage likelihood mm -hmm. that the student pulled something from a, an AI tool, a generative AI tool. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm going to ask, like, what's the right percentage to use as a threshold? But tell your story before we put too much faith in sure. this. Sure. So uh, you've seen these tools. There's one called GPT-0, I think. There's a, there are many, many of them. And um, they are supposedly, they're designed to tell you when people have used generative AI, and you plug the text in, and it says yes or no. So the, the Turnitin version gives you, um, it's like the similarity score for plagiarism, but it just gives a percentage. So it'll say... 75% of this paper has been you know, uh, written with generative AI. So I tested it. I uploaded something that I had written. And guess what my score was? 100%, right? 100% written by, by generative AI. So I'm pretty sure that I'm not a robot, although maybe Jen would disagree or Suki, I don't know. But I thought I wrote that material. And I'm telling you because these tools are, are wildly inaccurate. You'll get lots of false positives and false negatives, by the way. Um, and so I always tell teachers, you want to be very cautious about using those tools as evidence for um, students having used you know, generative AI to cheat on, on some kind of assessment in your class. It doesn't mean that you dismiss it entirely, but I think it's part of one of the tools that are available to you to determine um, how you want to approach a student. I will say, going back to the thing that we mentioned at the very beginning of the conversation about those three stages of intervention, this reliance on these detecting tools is one symptom, I would argue, of our desire to, to be in that third stage, right? We want to spend our time at the end, the detection and catching people. If we get away from that, then we don't have to rely on these tools anyway, right? We don't have to you know, think about them so much. So that's that's what I would say about detection tools. If you search on, on the internet and those sources that we provided for people, there is a lot of evidence that says that these tools are wildly inaccurate. Um, and I should add that there is also some research that shows that they are biased toward English language learners because of syntax and the way they tend to write sentences. So these detectors uh, will show, it's more likely they'll show that those students are um, They'll be flagged for, for having used generative AI when they haven't. Oh, how interesting. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. When you're an English language learner, you're, you're not really adapting a style. You're following rules. And those are exactly the kinds of things that are going to be picked up as, as machine-like. Yes. In fact, uh, they say that you know, when you're looking at these documents, one of the ways that things that you're looking for is the, the quote-unquote voiceless text, right? something that doesn't seem like it's uh, written by a person. And so they think that there's some connection between that and... and um, Brent's voiceless. I know. <laughs> and, uh, I, I asked you guys to speak to this because I, I get information on, uh, on plagiarism uh, complaints that have been filed against students. Uh, and there's a large increase. Uh, it started in spring term as ChatGPT was introduced, and it continues to rise. And up until now, I've been thinking, well, this is a student problem. You know, We're going to have to address them some way. But when I heard the story of your own test, Brett, immediately I was like, oh my gosh how many of these are false positives and and we are we are doing a disservice to students and could really hurt their confidence and hurt them in significant ways by making an accusation that may not be substantiated which is a good time for Suki to tell her story about how to approach students um, if you do think there's something going on. Can I tell two stories? <laughs> tell them. Okay, so the first story is actually about the first student I ever caught plagiarizing. And the reason why I want to bring it up is because uh, we didn't have Turnitin at the time. And number one, I had a really bad prompt. That was my fault, but it was my first year teaching, so I will give myself a pass. Um, and the student wrote a paper about how to swim, which, um, again, bad prompt. That wasn't the prompt. She, I, it was something more broad, and that's what she did. And I started reading it, and I was like, wow, um, I'm a swimmer, and I'm a writer, and I could not have written such a comprehensive discussion of how to swim freestyle. And so I called my sister, who is a lifeguard, and I said, hey, I had a student who wrote about um, how to swim freestyle. And she said, oh, okay, why don't you read it to me? So I started reading it to her, and she said, stop. 
And then she continued reading it to me because the student had copied her essay word for word out of the water safety instructor's manual. So this was not on the internet. And so for me, I used to always use this story when I was talking to my students about plagiarism because I said, the reason why I suspect plagiarism is when suddenly your voice doesn't add up to me, where my understanding of who you are doesn't add up to me. And who she was as a writer before that paper, her, her writing was very mushy. That's my technical term. Um, and suddenly it was crisp and perfect. Perfect. And I was just like, she didn't write this. But I don't look at every student and assume they all cheat. Um, but I think going back to what Brett was saying and, and Jen about how a reliance on Turnitin makes us become more focused on the punishing versus like maybe preventing it or helping them along the way. Um, when Turnitin came out with the feature of AI deterrent, or detector, um, everybody was just like, oh my gosh, it's couching me left and right. And I had one student um, submit a paper, and it was a research paper. All the others had a zero. I had one student who had 12%. And I was just like, he, it was his second class with me, and I knew him. And I was just like, I don't, he didn't, it's not plagiarism. I don't know what happened. It's not AI. Um, I had a suspicion because he had submitted, it, it was the intro paragraph, and he'd submitted it to me at different stages. And my suspicion was that he had um, used Grammarly every time he submitted it. And so he'd used Grammarly on that section maybe three times. And so I pulled him aside and I said, hey, so I got a flag and I just, if you could explain to me what happened here. Let's let's talk about it. And I think that that's what Elliot was getting at, is that I didn't go, hey, you plagiarist, get over here. Um, or just posted the zero. On, yeah, on zero. You fail. Um, I just said, you know, let's talk about it. Could you kind of walk me through what happened here? And um, when I said, this is what I think, after he gave me his... Um, his point of view. And he said, oh yeah. And then he got a uh, freaked out and he's like, should I never use Grammarly? And I was like, no, <laughs> use it. Just don't run it through your paper like a hundred times. So there you go. Um, let's, uh, let's switch a little bit to implications on workforce and then we'll come back to how, to how to think about that in terms of our own programming. And then we'll open it up to you all. People starting to feel smarter? Good, good. Thank you, panel. Um, John. Uh, we're all reading these articles, top five jobs to go, top 10 jobs to go, the next, the 20 jobs that won't be here in 20 years. Uh, can you give us some, do some synthesis for us? So what are the areas that you have the greatest concerns about? And then let's work backwards in terms of how we respond to them. Kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning. The, the more that you, the work that you're contributing in your occupation um, is repetitive in nature and could be done by someone um, pretty much without engaging their brain, as we'll say, you are definitely at more risk. So, but that doesn't mean entire areas. I'm, I'm gonna share uh, the law field, um, since we have a couple lawyers in the room. Um, it's on both lists. It's on the list of most endangered jobs, and it's also on a list of jobs that will be more safe against AI, and there's a reason for that. If your job as an attorney is one where you're mostly doing wills or, or very basic form filling out style of legal, or you're doing legal analysis and data, those type of things, your job probably is a little bit more at risk. But if you're an attorney who litigates and is in the courtroom, you actually have much greater job security. So again, it's almost hard to break it down by job category. It really gets down to what you're doing within your role. Something I heard Nadia say earlier, and I'll share a quote that was uh, given to me by one of my uh, former professors, but it was, um, I'm gonna paraphrase it. You will most likely not lose your job to AI, but you may very well lose your job to someone who uses AI better than you do. And that's something really to be aware of when we're talking about what we're teaching and what we're learning. If we ignore it completely and we don't teach our students how to use it, how to use it well, they're going to be at a disadvantage when they get to the workforce. So the workforce will embrace almost anything that is going to lead to efficiency. AI definitely will lead to efficiency. Where there's going to be some real severe concerns, and, and, and I had is, is the disproportional impact of some of these areas. A lot of the occupations um, currently where repetitive um, work is done are in rural, smaller areas where the impact of those job losses are gonna be much greater. 
than it would be in a dynamic environment um, that embraces change and has a multifaceted overlaying structure of, of occupations and careers. So in looking at how AI is brought up, is implemented and, and becomes more and more readily available. For those that grew up in Nebraska and saw the, the harvesters when they came out and the harvesters are out sweeping the field and there's 100 people doing that work, that might be work done by 10 people in the future. With one couple of people controlling them, they're all guided, um, the work is done, there's a few people fixing things once in a while. So it's going to be a change. How does that affect an economy where there's nothing else there? that is gonna have a dramatic impact. So let, let's just take that one example because I, I wanna make sure we all get that. So the job that the machine might have replaced may be gone, but now there's new jobs to support the machine and to Correct. coordinate the machine's work. Correct, there'll be jobs who are gonna be making sure the machine is doing their job correctly. There's gonna be jobs that are gonna analyze um, what the machine is doing. Now there's some of that going on at machine learning level already, where machines are actually monitoring other machines, but there still is someone who is the step back, who is monitoring the monitoring of those levels. So again, the more dynamic uh, an economy is and a workforce structure is, it'll be more able to adapt to the changing nature of what AI is doing to it. Where it's really going to be a challenge is, again, small rural areas or very limited and smaller scale people who can't afford the investment of the tools of AI and the things like that. So that's where there's going to be some dynamics. But what is going to come out of this is the ability, again, what we're trying to do with all of our students, of course, is we're teaching them how to learn. So what we want to do um, going forward as community college is really stress that I'm trying to get the thing, that we're in a constant learning environment. Learning is not disposable anymore. Learning now is gonna to have to be something that you engage in every single day, and you can apply what you learned the day before to what you're doing now. And it's those particular jobs that you are going to help evolve your job and your functions that are gonna be most valuable to employers. So from that standpoint, that's what I'm gonna look at. The other thing is, there are jobs that are going to be very stable and actually may increase. Um, areas in the, the trades, the demand is going to continue to increase because you're actually doing something. It's one thing to manufacture something in a large facility where it's manufactured in a nice closed closet environment, but building the gateway building is not something you're going to do at a warehouse somewhere else. Um, those jobs are going to be here and they're going to be very specific. The more you rely on automation to do the menial tasks, the more important the tasks that can't be done by AI are going to become. So therefore, they'll be better rewarded and hopefully um, better security for the people who can do those tasks. So it's going to be understanding what tasks should I be learning and what tasks then should I be implementing um, in your current job or in a related job if you want to be reskilled. So John, what does that look like in, in all of our programming, but particularly in CE programming, CTE programming, in terms of how we're teaching and the level of what we're teaching? So, you know, accountants I've heard is another field where, you know, that job is gonna change. You might be processing mm -hmm. a lot more returns. So how do we change accounting to meet the needs of using more AI to generate more returns but still having oversight and still having you know, very complicated custom jobs that are now gonna be the, the meat of that profession. How do we alter what we're teaching so that we're not creating employees who are ready for an economy that's going to disappear? What I really enjoyed is I heard some good suggestions already at this end of the table. Project-based learning, doing a, an applied nature to what you're teaching, Ensuring that students interact with each other on these projects and in the learning, I think are gonna be some of the key success elements that we're gonna to have to implement. We're gonna, again, we're gonna to need to make sure that our students can learn what they're doing, communicate to others while doing it, and interact. Because the days of being able to sit in your cubicle and do your job and be left alone are really um, gonna become harder and harder because it's a lot easier to have a box sit in that cubicle and do the same thing over and over again. What we want is that dynamic interaction and we want that creative 
innovative thought to come forward. And employers are looking at that and they're also rewarding it. Um, but it also leads to job security and several other things. There will be industries that might change and to be disrupted and no longer exist at the extreme level. But again, there are jobs that will be evolving um, and will be coming out of this that hopefully will be able to compensate for that, again, based on your ability to learn and be flexible. I'm going to throw this last one out to anybody at the table, and then we'll open it up to others. So Ryan's got a microphone. Let us know if you've got a question uh, by raising your hand. So I, I remember first learning about Bloom's taxonomy a few years into my teaching, Bloom's Pyramid, and getting really excited, like thinking I knew a lot then, and now I know nothing, right? But at the time, I thought, like, this all pulls it together. I'm having the same thought lately about AI. So is, as we get ready to think about you know, preparing our students for jobs that don't become obsolete because of AI, are we just talking about moving our teaching and learning up on Bloom's taxonomy? Are we talking about more application, more creativity, um, less rote memorization, less repetitive skills? Is that oversimplification, or is there a piece of that that rings true, particularly for people who still aren't teaching? And I haven't done that in a decade. I'm going to answer before Suki turns on her mic, because I have something to add to John's comment. But you go next. I say, if you're feeling overwhelmed, like, oh, authentic assessment, project-based learning, I have no idea for my discipline, go to chat GDP and write in authentic assessments for whatever you teach and see what comes up. Because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's so many fabulous, great ideas out there. So see what it, give that as your brainstorm list. And then you can figure out how it can be applied to your specific course and to have higher blooms. There you go. I, I like reinventing the wheel. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, something that I keep thinking about, and it's partially just that there's been a lot of changes in how we teach English in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And so um, 15 years ago, I was, I love grammar. I would love to teach grammar. Um, we could all do a conversation about pronouns. Um, but the thing is that um, that, like, we no longer teach grammar in our classes. And it's partially, and, it, and you know, you can tell. But um, the other side of it is, well, you can. <laughs> Sorry. You can. Um, but... <laughs> But the thing is, like, it's partially, but the, and that was before you had things, tools like Grammarly and Grammarly. It's, and so the thing is, they, you know, it's being replaced by other things. And so um, something that Jen had said, um, maybe early on when we were just talking about this last year, is that the, it, like, this is an opportunity for us to grow in terms of what, like, you, you get sort of stuck in what you're doing in terms of what you're teaching. And, and it's an opportunity to grow and um, change what you're doing in the classroom. And the example that I would give is like I did authentic assessment last spring my final assignment in my English 1a class is that my student I and I do it so I don't have to read the same paper a hundred times so each of my students picks a president and they have to uh, not a college president a, a real, US, president. A real uh, yeah sorry a real president um, <laughs> the, <laughs> um but they have to pick one of our presidents, and they the last five presidents are off limit because it's just um, then they'll be like Trump, and I'm like no 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 it's like before that. But they have to pick one policy that the president um, implemented during their their time in office, and the student has to argue whether or not that poli policy was ultimately beneficial for the country. And how I altered it was actually saying that the final piece is how has that policy impacted you? And so I, I this will be the first time to see it, but I'm really like and it was this weird thing where I never even thought about that until I did the training and then it was just like oh my gosh like first of all it makes it relevant and one of the policies that my students always get back to is Eisenhower because he did the cross um the transnet he did the highway system and it created ghettos and so it actually was this really like on the surface a good thing for society but underneath it actually created a lot of problems and so it'll be interesting to see what my students do with it. And I definitely won't get a whole bunch of papers about how that president contributed to the Civil War. Because like, like for 20 years, that's all they did. Um, I will stop talking. Uh, and Nadia, did you have your arm up, your head up as well? No? Go ahead. <laughs> What's the big picture on this impact on teaching and learning? I, I use Bloom's taxonomy. Is it, is it just raising the bar in terms of the, the kind of level we're trying to hit in our teaching and learning on Bloom's taxonomy, or is that oversimplifying? No, I think we will have to evolve as faculty, but I think we also have a very unique opportunity. Like this is presenting us with 
an amazing opportunity at the community college level because tuitions are increasing tremendously in the four-year universities. And we as community colleges are receiving a lot of students. A lot more students are, are this is their only option, right, financially. And so we can take the learnings from you know, professional development. We can also, um, a lot of our transferable courses, and we can kind of marry the two and really create um, a student body that's concerned, that's well-informed, that has uh, background knowledge in both you know, technical skills that are useful for the workforce, but also skills that are transferable, if that's an option, right? So we really are at a, at a place in the world where we can have a lot of impact on a large student population, on a younger generation. And so um, I think that our faculty um, will have to embrace the change in terms of the tooling, um, but we also have to be mindful of the impact that has on our faculty as well. And so um, there needs to be more resources and scaffolding that we would otherwise present to our students for us as well, especially for those that want to learn how to incorporate these tools but don't have experience with these tools. And so, um, I mean, I, I always am advocating for, for faculty members and for teachers because I feel like we are like the, the people in the background and there's a lot of work, upfront work and in time investment that comes into learning these tools and, and if there are more mechanisms to support our faculty and to really value them and to celebrate them for the little wins, I think that that, that really goes far because we, are, we really have our boots on the ground when it comes to working with our students directly and having that personal relationship. So. so, I mean, coming out of this already, I'm already hearing, we probably need a town hall on, you know, just for students, expanding the library's upcoming workshop into a whole discussion of what are the tools out there, what are the ethics of this. It, it, Jen, I was thinking we need like an economics and political science town hall on what are the implications of this. If, if this is another information age, it's like another level of information age, and think of what we did for a whole disenfranchised working class and created a whole political movement out of that. What's the future of politics? What's the future of the economy after we make this transition from AI over the next 20 years? Lots to think about. Um, but I want to bring it home and talk about stuff um, that is real and relevant for all of our lives and our jobs. So we're going to take questions. Ryan's going to look for you if you got a hand up. And please wait for the microphone, because we are recording it, and no one will hear you on the recording unless you wait for the microphone. Hi, I had a quick question regarding creating safety for our students to jump to this creative level in their academic journey. Because so many of the students are seeking to be perfect enough here so that they can transfer elsewhere. That I found when I gave creative prompts in, in, in my classes, that the pushback from the students was, no, 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 tell me exactly what you want, exactly how I get the A, exactly how I do this perfectly for you. And so as much as I love where you were taking this discussion, I think we need to think about the student side of how we support them to be creative enough and make mistakes and fight that perfectionism journey that they're on. I'm going to go first this time. Um, I think that that's a big reason why you have um, the scaffolding. So, like, especially with, like, the earlier stages, um, they're sort of, they, like, they get, like, it, authentic assessment doesn't work. And I'm, I'm acting like I'm the expert. Um, but it doesn't work if you are not willing to commit to every single piece of it. And so if you have them do all this scaffolding and then you just give them a check mark, then you've not really given them feedback. And so what I really strive to do in the composition classes is for them to know Know that you, your first draft is definitely not your last, and but I'm going to give you feedback that will help you, and it's okay to make a mistake because I'm going to give you feedback, and I will throw it off to Jen. I think that your first time doing it is going to be a, either a major success or a major failure, and that's fine as the instructor, right? You have to kind of test it out and see what happens, and maybe that allows multiple revisions, right? So someone turns something in, you're like, oh. Let's work together, give this the time, give it another chance. 
if the goal is the process and watching the critical thinking, then let them do it three, four times. Does it matter? No, because you want them to keep doing it. So I think it really is the during the assessment, the document that Brett and I, Brett mostly worked on, is that the during the assessment is the whole point of explaining the purpose and the end goal. And if that means multiple revisions, multiple check-ins, then that's fine. And I have a lot of students in that same category because my course is a transfer course. And so they have to have the A because they have to, you know, all the things. And I tell them, you're going to struggle on this. This particular assignment, I want you to struggle. And if you get half of it wrong, then you've done it correctly, but you're going to get to redo it again. And so I think that give them knowing that kind of reduces the stress. Thank you both. And um, the document that uh, Jen and, and Brett created again, Brian, what is the QR code already in the invite or the end and we're going to project in just a few minutes? A um, couple last questions, but one there and then over here on the side of the room. Oh, this might be from a fellow collegiate athlete up there, but uh, yesterday a uh, student editor assigned a story to a reporter, uh, a rookie reporter, to do an interview with the football coach here at Saddleback College. And I thought I'd be really cool, so I went over to the student and I said, hey, let's uh, go on uh, chat GPT-4 and see if there's some questions for uh, a football coach. 20 questions came up that just blew my mind. I mean, this is really something. But in generative AI, I just now, while we're at this meeting, thought, what if she goes home? There's probably a lot of information online about this coach. And if they put in the record of the coach and who they're going to play next, might this student who's way ahead of me on this going to come up with a story that we'll have to double check um, about the football and football program here. Uh, so let's maybe broaden that out. Uh, implications for journalism. Thoughts? The, the beat journalist is probably going to have some challenges ahead. Or if you are someone who writes a story just about the game that happened last night and you're writing it the next day, chances are um, you could be in, in some soft area that maybe the newspaper will have opted to do a chat GPT version instead. However, if you're an investigative reporter and you're doing some of the other stuff, then again, um, you may be much more safer. <laughs> I can add something to that really quickly. On journalism, uh, we've already seen, in fact, for a long time, a lot of the um, what you might call routine reporting has been outsourced to AI for years now. So if you follow uh, Econ, gens, if you follow the stock market, those, you know, what's happening in the markets today, a lot of that is auto-generated. Um, they're doing the same for sports scores, right? So if it's just a quick, this team beat this other team, that sort of thing, I think that is very likely to be outsourced to AI. The more complex kind of thinking that we're talking about here is very unlikely to be outsourced to AI. It's, it's a lot harder to do, to replicate. Right. But it's also, those are few. Or, it's, it's, I was saying to John, it's the lawyer thing again. So like with, like, and it, or did Mike, Mike's still there. Um, but the, it's the lawyer thing again, the idea that um, the, the, the uh, reporters that Mike is talking about, those are, that's where they start. And that's the thing that I worry about because that's where they start. And it's very few who become those investigative um, journalists and, and they don't have that path anymore. So that, that, that does concern me um, in relation to, especially for writing. Um, I will stop talking. I know, I keep saying that's that. Okay. One more question, please. Yeah, I, I have one question and this is about the future of AI. Uh, from my perspective, I see what we're doing with ChatGPT really being a public kind of AI, generative AI. We are also going to start getting private AI. And President Stern, you actually brought this up. Last uh, spring, you talked about the opportunity to having an AI tutor here in the tutoring center. And that would be beautiful here at Saddleback. Um, but that is not something you're going to get out of ChatGPT. I mean, and, then, and then the third type, I'm going to bring up the Khan Academy, which is another educational institution. Every student at the Khan Academy has their own personal AI tool that they go through the program with. Consider that. So um, both for, for Nadia and Homi and, and for that matter for John, um, what's the future of teaching? Are we worried about teaching? Because I was thinking, 
there are routine things that a tutor can do, like explain this to me, right? But you could already do that now in ChatGPT. It would give you a pretty good explanation by synthesizing stuff from the internet. But I, I know there are more specific questions too. Um, but should tutors be worried? Should teachers be worried? Where do we fall? Well, sorry, I still say we. Where, where do all of our faculty fall in terms of that level of what we do not being repetitive, not being so patterned that a machine can pick it up? Are we worried about that? Should we be? Really, nobody wants to answer? Oh, come I'll, on. I'll start with a kind of a generic -y workforce approach to it. Um, early childhood ed and elementary education, they actually see as being extremely safe in an AI environment just because of the interaction with children and, and that element of it. So actually being one of the safer occupations. They say that some, some education that you may do that is rote and repetitive may well be augmented and may be enhanced and changed um, due to the tools that will now be available through AI. But the role itself of the facilitator of the learning is still gonna be the key. So it, it's and just like lawyering. Yes. There's still teachers. In fact, I think it's less je in jeopardy. I, I don't mm -hmm. see teachers on the list. I'm going to be very open and transparent about that very often. Um, but it's, it may change a little bit as it's already started to change from sage on stage to learning facilitator, the term you use. Mm -hmm. That trend has to continue, um, even, and it might be expedited as a result of AI. Is that fair to say? Yes, and, and again, the hope is it will be an elevated experience for students with elevated outcomes and goals and everything. That's the utopian perspective of AI. Um, so one last question, John. Um, any good new jobs coming out of this? <laughs> the first thing that jumped to everybody's mind when they heard the word prompt engineer, everybody got really excited. Ooh, engineer, all right, all right. Um, Working, using, managing, creating that and enhancing and improving that tool of AI is going to be an explosive opportunity for a number of years, um, at least until it is able to do its own work. But for the most part, it isn't going to anytime soon. Most of the time with technology, what technology can do and what it actually is marketed and, and sold and does, there's a huge difference. Um, most people say we're, even with IT, we're only about 17% of the, the actual use of IT we're actually using on a regular basis. It could do more. So AI may have certain abilities and, and other things, but the actual day-to-day -day usage, which is what drives jobs, um, will kind of modify what it can, the, the gross impact that they're talking about. Please, Nadia. Okay, so uh, just a shout out to Conmigo. That is the tutor that's a part of Khan Academy. Um, and this actually raises a really good point and an, a new kind of side of AI, and that's AI in the learning space. So there is this whole um, new field called learning engineering where you can incorporate AI into your course um, and you can get feedback from the students kind of indirectly through these tools. And um, a lot of the people leading the research in this field are, are from Stanford and from Carnegie Mellon, um, where this idea originated from. But now you can do alternatives to A-B testing. You can do personalized learning, um, especially if you have online courses. The modules can then be received by students based on you know, whether or not they need a little bit of extra help. They might get some more lectures and some more materials or exercises to do. Um, so it actually is a really exciting field because it levels the playing field. If a student does need a little bit more assistance on a particular topic or concept, um, they can be provided with resources. And then the really cool thing about Conmigo is that um, they have chat GPT, but they have two of them talking to each other. So one of them kind of assists the student, um, just like regular chat GPT, and another one tries to interpret the intent of the student. And so it, it's a different style and a different approach of really understanding student engagement in the future. And so I think that these tools, they, they can actually be supportive of a lot of the um, student learning outcomes that we have. So another idea, like let, we should do one on you know, AI in teaching and gamification in mm -hmm. teaching, like, yeah. Um, I wanna give big thanks to Homi Badanwala, Nadia Ahmad, 
John Jaramillo, Brett Myron, Jen Pakula, and Suki Fisher. Can I get a round of applause for them? <laughs> Raise your hand if you feel smarter. You feel smarter? Learning outcome achieved for about half the students. So <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>